I'm happy to uh, toss it over to three physicians who are using the Monarch platform to discuss uh, their advanced technology use in peripheral nodule manage management. Dr. Manley? I just want to start by talking about what robotics means to me and a lot of us in the space who use it regularly. Um, it's not just about reaching the target, it's about having that stability, control, and vision, and ability to work within the space. A lot of times we're asked uh, about diagnostic yield or um, navigation success, and those are important questions, but what's more important is that we're able to interface with the tissue we're working on. Um, we're able to see what we're doing, we're able to repeat with good reproducibility and fidelity, uh, the movements we're doing, the biopsies we're doing, um, so that we have good outcomes, good safety profile, and we're able to introduce new technologies uh, that work with the platform. So for those of you who are not familiar with the way the robot works, there's an external sheath, which is a lighter blue, and then there's the internal camera. Each one moves independently. That, that allows us to customize the shape of the robot, um, customize our drive, and provide good support of the camera um, and that ability to get into those difficult to reach apical segments um, and provide really good stability when we're in the lower lobes, which have more respiratory variation. So the question though is what am I driving? And basically these uh, robotic bronchoscopes are sort of bespoke um, custom made devices where you've got four pull wires in the outer sheath and four pull wires in the camera. And uh, by providing tension to each of those pull wires in combination, you can manipulate the robot into different shapes. And that tension is monitored, both the uh, amount the pull wires are deflected and, and then also the tension in each one of them. So what does that mean? What, what we talk about is tri-state driving, where you can drive the scope, the sheath, or both of them in paired mode. And that allows us to to provide a little bit of a different signature when we're driving paired or um, with the camera alone. You know, the articulation section on the sheath is 45 millimeters and the scope is 60 millimeters. When the scope and the sheath are together, um, you're getting a, a, a bend radius of about 20 millimeters. And when the scope is by itself, the bend radius is about 25 millimeters. So a little bit of a wider circle. Um, the load is shared between the scope and the sheath so that when you're driving together, the camera as you, as you bend or flex it is not fighting the sheath. So you can see in this um, graphic on the left side of the screen, um, when you're driving paired, the, the load is shared. And then as the scope starts to advance past the sheath, um, the scope takes on more of the load and the, the sheath drops away until it's not providing any of the, the bending force. Also, there's an auto pairing function, so that if you pull the scope back into the sheath, the scope will automatically pair. That way the camera doesn't get buried in the sheath or cause kinking or anything like that. Um, and that way, uh, if you need to pick up your sheath, you don't have to do any sophisticated toggle functions. You can just back up into the sheath and drive them forward together. So because of the safety tensioning uh, monitoring of those pull wires, a couple of things will happen. When the, 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 the tension force is low, now you'll get normal articulation speed. You'll be able to move the camera or the sheath side to side uh, normally. Um, as the tension grows, that is to say that the, the force on the pull wires, if you start pushing against tissue and generating a lot of tension without deflecting the camera, the machine's gonna slow the articulation speed. If you keep fighting and keep pulling and increasing the tension on those pull wires even more, that articulation is gonna be capped. Eventually it'll auto relax. And then if you keep pushing it, it's gonna fall. Um, also, when you start to back up, if you're in a really tight bend in a soup sag or an apical segment, then you've got a really extreme bend on the scope and you start to pull back. Uh, the scope does not want you to pull on the tissue so it'll start to relax automatically. Within a couple of seconds of drawing backwards, the scope's gonna become completely flaccid and allow you to remove it without difficulty. That way, if your mind is elsewhere, if you're worrying about the biopsy, worrying about the patient, if you're controlling bleeding, um, you don't have to worry about remembering to relax the scope as you pull it back. So those are some basic safety features built into the mechanics of it. What does that mean for us? Well, first of all, a lot of bronchoscopists are used to seeing uh, 
very standard anatomy. And this is a little different because the scope um, doesn't rotate. You don't rotate your wrist to, to flex into the left upper or right upper lobes. So instead of seeing the apical anterior and posterior where you're used to seeing them, or the apical posterior anterior and lingula in the left upper lobe, the scope bends on a horizon line. So now the apical is going to be um, in a different location than you might used to be. And on the left upper lobe, that apical posterior segment, it's going to feel like you're driving uh, to the severe left and almost down. Um, and, and that change in orientation um, takes a little bit of getting used to. We're starting to learn more about the anatomy. Um, in some of these these more distal segments and seeing how uh, regular and reproducible a lot of them are um, from case to case. If we were just to drive our camera into the um, right upper lobe, you'll run into I think, two problems. One is that, as I mentioned, that the bend radius is going to be different if you pair it with the sheath. It's going to be tighter. And the other is that as you start to direct force downwards, uh, it's hard to translate that force then upwards into the apical segment. So you'll start to get kinking. Instead, if you drive your sheath in to the apical segment and then come up with your uh, internal camera, you have much better stability um, and much better control. Similar to the, the superior segment in the lower lobes, if you just drive in your camera and then try and drive forward, you know, your, your force vector is gonna be down, uh, not into the subseg. So, you're not gonna get that travel that you expect. You're not gonna get um, that, that stability that, that you're looking for. So, so pairing that um, sheath and scope is very important. We talk a lot about the navigation and the way that navigation system works. There's similar to um, previous technologies using electromagnetic, there's a, uh, an algorithm that is predictive and it gives you um, the likelihood that you're in one segment or the other. When the segments are very close together, the, the machine might be saying 51, 49, not quite sure where you are. Uh, the way that the Monarchs improved that navigation is they, they've added pattern recognition in the camera. So it's actually taking pictures of the carinas as you approach each one and continuously registers uh, the device to tighten the navigation as you drive. Um, so in, as I said, instead of getting a kinked scope that doesn't get much travel, you get a much better a uh, more secure, more stable platform through which you can introduce whatever tools you need to. Um, one of the questions we get a lot is, um, why is the yield across all platforms uh, not 100% if there's an airway leading to the lesion? And I think a lot of us think that when we see an airway sign, we're gonna see endobronchial tumor. And that if we put out a needle or a brush or a forcep, you're gonna run right through tumor. And um, what we found, no matter what platform you're using, is that you don't see that very often. A lot of times, uh, and that, this is something we've learned by driving out to these lesions and seeing them, is that very rarely is there tumor eroding through the bronchus. You might see a little bit of mucosal irregularity, might look a little friable, but um, you don't see lots and lots of tumor. And so the way to get a good sample is actually to start turning your, your scope or the, or the direction of your needle a little bit off, off axis. And the way you're able to do that is by getting proximity to the lesion. So we talk about what makes, uh, what counts as sort of navigational success. And as you can see, um, when you're further out from the lesion, the, your sort of angle of articulation where you, where you pass from one side of the lesion to the other is quite narrow. For a one centimeter lesion at 25 millimeters from, from dead center, you've only got a window of about 16 degrees. Whereas if you're all the way up on it, five millimeters, you've got 53 degrees. Now, does this mean you should bury the camera right into the lesion every time? No, I, I don't think it does. And, and I think that anyone who works with central airway tumors, if you were gonna do a Wang needle biopsy of a central airway tumor or do a forceps or start to ablate it, you're not right up on the tumor. You're sitting back 10 or 15 or even 20 millimeters. So you can see your tools, so you have good control, so you don't foul your camera with, with blood splatter. Um, and so what we've found is that if you can be within 20 millimeters, you know, uh, you've got at 20 millimeters, you've got an 18 degree window. If you can get to 15 degrees, it really increases to 28, or sorry, if you can get to 15 millimeters, it increases to 28 degrees of, of um, articulation. And so you can really improve your target window I think once you get within 10 or five millimeters, you're really so pressed up against the lesion 
um, that really makes it difficult to do your biopsies effectively. So I think that sweet spot is somewhere between 10 and 20 or even 25 millimeters. Um, you want to be able to see the needle go through the wall of the lesion. Uh, sometimes you can put out your needle, especially if you're using a flexible needle. It'll just scave up the side. You get a lot of uh, shaved off bronchial cells and mucus and debris. So you want to be able to see a good puncture as you put the needle out. And um, then you want to be able to see if there's bleeding. You don't want to have your camera so pressed up against um, that you've got a fouled lens. Now you can't avoid it all the time if you're trying to do a, a non-bronchocentric lesion. Sometimes we'll push that camera all the way up against the wall of the airway so that we can get our needle uh, as lateral to the airway as we can if we're, if we're shooting for a lesion that's, that's far off the beaten path as it were. So here's an example of um, a lesion. So now I'm 21 millimeters away from this nodule, which you would think, you know, I'm at that sort of 18 uh, to 16 degree window. But look at my needle sheath. I can see my needle sheath. I can see the needle going through the wall of the airway. And I've got it, my target perfectly locked on to my lesion. Um, looking at this drive, um, I wanted to show you the registration and the drive to the lesion. And because it's a fairly distal target, I've put it on three times speed. So, th so the 3x speed is the drive up to the lesion. You can see I'm using my suction function there putting my sheath in position. And then um, as we drive into this is now apical posterior, as I mentioned, that bend almost feels like you're driving left and downward. And then I'm using my, uh, my map view, my virtual view, and then switching to my CT overlay and then driving up into this apical section. Once I get to this branch point, I'm looking again at which airway gives me the best target on the lesion because they're very parallel. And I've decided that it's the more medial of the two airways. So now I'm about 20 millimeters away, 19, 17 millimeters away from the center of the lesion. And I'm trying to look with my radial ultrasound. Now this is um, scanning the airway to see where I've got the best radial picture. And as I move the radial around backwards and forwards, now this is at normal speed again. Uh, it's uh, slowed down from the 3X. But you can see by scanning, I'm looking for, for an eccentric lesion. And while my target is right on the nodule as I've marked it, um, where I'm going to put my needle out can be a little bit different. And so when I bring my needle sheath out, um, I put it to the airway mucosa, and then I advance the, the needle through the, the airway wall. And so um, when I show you the fluoro image, um, you'll see, again, this camera is not buried into this nodule. Um, we're 21 millimeters from the target. But when you're working, that, that feels like the right distance. And so everybody's a little bit different. It's one of the things I had to learn. You can see the poke hole there in the mucosa. I knew I got through. Um, I can inspect for bleeding. I've got good visualization. Uh, this is a little saline that I've been, that I've been uh, infused there at the end of the case just to make sure nothing's bleeding. And so I maintain good visualization. So the question is, what else can we add to improve the quality of the biopsy, to improve some of our um, specificity and surety that we are where we feel we need to be. You know, confocal microscopy has been in the space, both in the GI and pulmonary space for years. Um, it's been used to image alveoli. You can see here, looking at small uh, capillaries in the alveoli using a, a probe, a bronchoscopic probe. Um, and this is a technology that was very good for diffuse lung disease. You can see looking at fibrosis, organizing pneumonia, healthy alveoli. The question is, was it uh, or is it helpful when you're trying to do biopsies? And so it's been used successfully in um, uh, central lesions by EBUS. Um, and I think that being able to, to penetrate these lesions under direct visualization and provide some stability with the EBUS scope gives you reasonable image. The question is when you're doing peripheral biopsies, is there a way that you can have the, the needle go into the nodule and be able to scan through, you know, the, the, you're scanning at only about 150 microns. So you don't want a, a lot of drift or motion artifact. And so looking at these previous studies in central lesions, the, the imaging fidelity is pretty good when compared to rapid onsite. Question is, can you use it in a very stable bronchoscopic platform? Um, I know it's been tried in the past in um, some, some other peripheral bronchoscopic technology. And I think one of the major complaints I've heard from people is that they weren't able to ensure the stability that you could image without a lot of drift or motion artifact. And so we're doing 
a um, prospective pilot study looking at safety and feasibility. And we're going to be looking at um, diagnostic yield of the technology and inter-observer agreement. Um, this is something we're doing in partnership with our colleagues at the, uh, in Amsterdam. Um, they've published uh, pretty widely on the technology and a good experience with the imaging. Um, I'll show you a quick video of um, what it means to be doing the drive and the, um, the cell physio imaging, uh, needle-based confocal imaging at the same time. So here's, this is a right middle lobe lesion. It was partially cystic. And um, you can see driving into the right middle lobe and toggling between my screens, you can see that my lesion is sort of uh, down in the lateral segment of the right middle lobe. And then this airway, you can see it's a little bit of uh, an, an, an acute angle. So I'm uh, over flexing into it and then I'll recenter in the middle of the airway. Um, now that I've intubated that small subsegment, I'm driving closer to the lesion. You can see that it's um, within 20 millimeters. So again, getting into that window of opportunity where you're at least getting um, you know, a 20, 25 degrees of, of freedom moving through. Now at 15 millimeters, I'm up to that 28 degrees of, uh, of, of targeting uh, window. So now my target is lined up with the lesion. And I'll, and I'll show you, I do my first pass, and this is on under fluoro, you can see the continuous fluoro imaging. I put my needle out, and then I put the Salvisio fiber through the needle, and you can see how stable the bronchoscope is. My hands are no longer touching the scope, and they're not touching the, the confocal fiber. And so, so this movement through, there's some respiratory variation, but I can move the camera, uh, the, the imaging fiber, to different places. Now I did a biopsy, rapid on-site was negative, and I actually move now I'm a little bit off target and I put my um, needle out and then my imaging fiber again. And again, these cases are not supposed to be exciting. This is as humdrum and as boring as it should be. It's, it's a non-moving robot with a non-moving needle. And when you do your imaging, you start to see some abnormal clumping of cells. Now, um, we need to do more cases and get more experience in, in reading these images, but these sort of pleomorphic clumping of cells um, have been suggestive of malignancy. And when we got our rows, so I pull the confocal fiber out of the needle and do biopsies right where I imaged, and the second pass was tumor cells. And so the question is, once you get into that, you know, you're within 20 millimeters of the nodule and you're biopsying in this small box and you're doing sort of a grid pattern biopsying and looking at your rapid onsite, how can you improve that reproducibility and how can you, you localize that nodule even better. The one thing you don't want to do is get blood on your rapid onsite and not be sure that you're in your lesion. If you can image effectively, can you recognize cancer or even better, can you recognize clearly benign cells that rule out malignancy and improve that negative predictive value. So those are things we're going to be answering in the future and this is just a small prospective pilot study to look at the feasibility. So I'd like to turn uh, everything over to uh, Gustavo and John. Um, both of them are coming from um, their uh, associate, Gustavo is the Associate Program Director, Pulmonary Critical Care Fellowship, Michigan State, and uh, John Egan, another interventional pulmonologist, is also coming from Michigan State. Thank you so much for that, uh, that introduction and for your, uh, for your talk, uh, Chris, it was really, exciting things coming, uh, coming down the pike. Um, what Gus and I wanted to do today was uh, describe our experience with uh, robotics and where we see our program and um, robotics going uh, in the future in terms of not only diagnosis of these uh, nodules in early stage lung cancers, but potentially even uh, treatment. So a little bit about, um, about our program. Uh, we're uh, uh, Spectrum Health affiliated with uh, Michigan State College of Human Medicine in, uh, Grand, Rapids, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, this is in West Michigan. It's a highly competitive market. We have um, two other large hospital systems in our region. Uh, we have a catchment area of uh, 2 million patients. Um, we have a large uh, referral volume for uh, lung biopsies and Part of that is um, due in part to our uh, lung cancer screening program, but also 
uh, a um, high incidence of endemic fungal infections uh, in Michigan that can also that can often be uh, confused with um, potential malignancies. And so more often than not, our surgeons preferred us to have tissue confirmation of neoplasm prior to uh, empirically removing a suspicious nodule that may even be avid on PET CT. Um, our uh, program uh, has run with two interventional pulmonologists, Gus and myself. Um, we have the full spectrum of interventional pulmonology for West Michigan, including airway therapeutics, advanced pleural procedures. We have a lung transplant center uh, and also a large uh, cancer center with a high uh, referral rates. So here's a timeline of our, uh, of our robotics program. Basically prior to 2018, our navigational bronchoscopy uh, capabilities were through the um, super dimension platform. And to give you uh, a sense of uh, the volumes, uh, we purchased our um, Monarch robot platform in December of 2018. And that year in the 11 preceding months, uh, we had performed approximately 90 navigational bronchoscopies. Within the first month of uh, acquiring the robotic platform, we quickly pivoted and performed approximately 21 cases. Uh, by 2019, we had performed a total of 108 cases and had been lucky enough to partner with uh, Chris and other early adopters to publish uh, multi-center early experience uh, in BMC that year. And then this year, uh, as of July 30th, we had performed an additional 99 cases and also had found a unique application to the uh, robotic platform and had partnered with our thoracic surgeons to uh, present a paper in which we preoperatively marked um, lesions that were going to be um, uh, sampled by wedge uh, resection um, with, uh, with dye so that uh, they could see the lesions uh, more easily with their robotic platform and uh, spare uh, more lung tissue for the patient. To date, we've performed approximately 228 cases and uh, have performed 18 cases with uh, comb beam CT scan. I'm going to um, hand it over to Gus, who's going to tell you a little bit about why we decided to um, perform some selected cases with uh, comb beam CT, and then we'll take you through our um, through our experience and our vision for the future. Thank you for that, John. I hope that you can hear me okay. And thank you for the organizers. Thank you, Oris, for allowing us to share our experience. And again, um, this is not a topic meant to be dogmatic. This, there's no one way to do it. Um, the ro robotic platforms are tools and there's no perfect approach. Uh, for me, after driving back in mid 2018, the Monarch and the handheld controller and uh, their versatility and being able to see and maneuver and free myself up for me. Uh, it didn't take me more than 30 seconds to a minute to realize that that, that was the next step into getting to ablation. Um, we could have stopped that diagnosis and, 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 and I'm very pleased to say that our results are conducive to a very successful uh, robotics program. But um, I think that it's embedded in our personality of uh, interventional pulmonology is that we want to do more. I don't think that I'm okay with diagnosis and reaching and then somebody else uh, addresses it. I think that being able to stand and, and, and do laser and, 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 and palliate breathlessness is, is great. But um, what if we can all dare to believe that we can combine uh, robotic platforms with, uh, with periphery reach and, and, and uninterrupted vision um, and be able to provide uh, or, or reach a target in what we used to call no man's land. Now it's ours and we can go far out there and we can put the tool inside and maybe even get so good at it that we can put it in the middle of the lesion. We all have uh, success stories in which we see a, a signal radial uh, in the radial probe, but we get a typical cells of non-diagnostic. So there has to be a better way. And the way that I designed uh, with uh, a lot of uh, feedback from uh, John and, and, and oncology and, and the surgeons in locally was, okay, we have a, a, a second to none robotic platform that can get us anywhere we want. 
with a fairly rapid uh, learning curve and we can get exactly where we want to be and then thread the tool exactly where we want it to be thread under uninterrupted visualization and once we get the tool where we believe it to be and the radial process were there why why stop there how can we confirm that this is going to be great so we master most of these things but we want to make sure that there's not a human error and there's not a tool uh, uh, you know, bias in there that it's just not giving us what we need to diagnose and potentially stepping stones to a blink. So we paired robotics and convincity and we developed protocols and, and, and we were able to access the resources that I'm sure that most of the uh, members in the audience have a convincity somewhere in EOR and it's not easy to get access to, but after a year and a half of working with John, we developed a protocol and we were, were pleased to say that uh, there's a, it, it's symbiosis. Whenever you combine CT with robotics, there's nothing we cannot do. Next slide, please. So this is uh, me and John. We have the robot uh, set up at an angle. We have the generator over the shoulder of the patient. We have the, uh, the arm of uh, the Convib CT. We use a particular brand, uh, but definitely uh, after the first or second case, we develop this stepwise approach that there's no interference, there's no clunkiness, there's no um, electromagnetic navigation problems just because you have the arm. What we do is we bring the Combeam CT, we make sure that the target is still there. One out of 18 cases, the target, the secondary target was smaller, so we didn't have to go after that. So out of 18 targets, uh, 17 uh, were able to be reached 100% uh, and 100% to lesion. Um, that, that's a paper that has been drafted and uh, we're finishing uh, uh, the write-up and we'll submit. But at the end of the day, the, more, the, the most important part on this is that once we spin and we can, head, uh, we can have this arm spin and the swing goes and shows the target is there and this isocenter and the table height is fine and we can see everything. We get this, uh, the arm out, we bring the robot at an angle, we navigate flawlessly, and then once we have either the radial probe, the needle, or the forceps in the lesion, then we spin a second time to confirm that we have 100% accuracy of tool in lesion. The beauty of this is I don't need a clamp, I don't need a fellow to hold it, the robotic platform frees myself up in order to do whatever I need to do. Next slide, please. John, do you want to take this one since you've been uh, driving quite a bit in the R with me? Yeah, so this is an example of a uh, right upper lobe lesion. And uh, similar to Chris's video, you can see it's coming down the uh, left main stem. Uh, currently, we're driving with the sheath um, in order to maximize our stability and our reach. So just skipping ahead here, um, uh, same lesion, uh, just rotated. Uh, and what we're doing here is now we're driving with the uh, inner scope and we're lining up on the lesion. Uh, you can see here that what the navigation has done is it's uh, actually contoured the lesion. So um, you have two options. You can make it look like a, uh, a sphere or um, uh, go with the contouring. Here we're um, putting a radial probe out so that we confirm that we're uh, in, the, uh, in the vicinity. Uh, and then we're going into what Gus and I like to call the first person shooter view, which uh, you can see at the bottom right of the screen, uh, just like a video game, you're lining your uh, crosshairs uh, right into the uh, center of the lesion, or at least the part of the lesion that's most accessible to us, accessible to us. And then you can see our needle uh, coming out uh, on the left hand uh, part. And then we're about 14 millimeters away. So Thank you for this. Go ahead. Oh yeah, so this is the same case. And uh, what we did once we uh, got our needle lined up is then we uh, did a comb beam CT scan. Uh, and then Gus will take you through um, what we saw next and, and how we approached it. Thank you, next paragraph please. Next slide. So, you know, and, and, and this, is, this is a trick, right? We have, a, we have a eccentric lesion, maybe a little bit, a little bit of a signal in there. So what do you do? I mean, this is not a case that is able to be done without vision. So technologies that do not allow for 
seamless aiming of the needle where the radio is, is just a shot in the dark. You have to have an interrupted vision. And once we get a little bit of a signal, then we can start thinking about threading instruments and make that magical spin of, a, of the cone beam to see where we are. Otherwise, the instrument goes anywhere. So here we go. This is a patient. Yes, that's a robotic platform. Yes, that's a cone beam CT. Yes, they're coexisting in the same room. No, it's not that they're incompatible. No, that they don't work. They work perfectly fine. My only word to the wise is BMI. You don't want to have BMIs of more than 30, 35 in there because you just don't have the real state to work and the cone beam can only do so much. Yeah, that's it. Eight seconds. We can set the, uh, the energy that we deliver. We can do a 0.5, a 1, a 2 millisieverts, whatever you want to see. But in eight seconds of a spin, we can go to the next slide, please. And, you know, there we are. Now, we can, we can do whatever we want with images. We can see the three axes. We can do augmented fluoroscopy. Uh, some of the platforms for Combeam CT allow for volumetric measurement. The gist of the lecture is not to do a master class on Combeam CT, is to show that there's many, many ways to approach peripheral navigation. And if you really want to leverage the vision of robotics, you want to leverage the fused um, uh, navigation, optical electromagnetic, if you want to leverage the accuracy, and we grew to trust. So the level of trust that we have in the software that Oris is providing us is maximum. If the software is telling us that the target is there, is there. The problem is that we have that one or two centimeters to the target that that's beyond what robotic bronchoscopy can provide you and the instrument goes anywhere. How do you know that there's a quaternary carina that makes your needle go somewhere else. That's where Combeam CT uh, brings a lot of value to the table. Value being outcome and cost, outcome plus quality over cost. This improves our quality of the work, very likely improve outcome. We have trials coming up, prospective, and I will publish my retrospective series with John. And the cost, it's second to none because once we get better with this, we can provide our patients with a third possibility for treatment that is non-surgical or chemo radiation. And at the same time, we prevent second, third, or fourth procedures from being done. So next slide, please. John, do you want to uh, get us through the three axes, please? Yeah, and, and to highlight uh, um, Gus's point, the cone beam CT is not, is not necessary for successful navigation and diagnosis of, of lung nodules. The, the reason that we're um, trying to um, marry these two technologies is because we want to make sure that our tools can go exactly where we want them to go in the lesion. So uh, on this current slide, you have both uh, axial, uh, coronal, and sagittal uh, images where we can confirm in all three planes, X, Y, and Z, that our needle is going exactly in the center of the lesion. And that's important because our vision for the future is with interventions with ablation, that it's, it's not going to be enough just to simply get tissue and get a diagnosis. We want to close that gap, that therapeutic gap, and then take the next step and uh, put an ablation catheter in and, and kill the tumor. And we'll talk about um, prospective studies, um, uh, collaborating with uh, thoracic surgery and radiation oncology in the future but our, our pie in the sky vision is that one day uh, we could take this technology and you could have a patient who has a suspicion of having lung cancer and do in a single procedure, a staging diagnostic and therapeutic procedure, patient wakes up in the recovery unit, you can say you had stage one lung cancer, now it's cured, we're gonna keep an eye on it with serial CT scans after having had a very precise uh, biopsy, confirmation, and ablation of the, of the lesion. Thank you for that, John. And again, uh, we as interventional pulmonologists are highly disruptive, and we have to push this. Obviously, the standard of care of surgery for early stages and chemo radiation leaves a gap of patients that are unattended to. So essentially, these are stepping stones. As John said, we couldn't be happier with the, uh, uh, with the many um, uh, attributes, uh, the many benefits of robotic bronchoscopy. But again, you, with a hammer, you know, you can, you can, you can you know, use it to 
put a, a nail inside of a board or you can build a house. So uh, it's a hammer. Monarch is a hammer. But what are you going to do with it? The sky is the limit. Look at the great work that Chris is doing. I mean, it's fascinating. And, and kudos for Chris to have that patience to take a look with a confocal microscopy. But in my case, um, I want to go out there. I want to make sure that I'm really good. And even though I have a, a lot of trust in, in Monarch's platform, I want to make sure that the instrument is where it should be. Next paragraph, please. Next slide. And, uh, you know, with John, we've been uh, gathering all of this data. Uh, we have uh, 18 cases to date. These are not cheap shots. These are not, we have a four centimeter, middle of the lung, the direct airway. We will be presenting this information in the manual that will be submitted, the size of the lesion, where it was, and we're gonna have pictures of this. So I don't like to talk about unpublished work, but essentially this being a forum to discuss, we performed successfully 18 cases with 100% accuracy of tooling lesion confirmed by real time Combeam CT. No problems, no complications, no pneumothoraces. Then we feel that based on the low end, it's not fair to talk about diagnostic yield. And we have two trials prospective that are being uh, conducted to evaluate diagnostic yield of uh, combined technologies. So we're also developing a stepwise approach that we developed with John in how to set up a room, how to pos position the patient, what are the stepping stones in order to have a flawless case which the first one or two cases took us two hours for everything. But right now, uh, between the time that the patient comes to the room to the time that the patient is wheeled out and we're doing uh, robotics, Convim CT confirmation and an EBUS, uh, we're pleased to say that our times are right around an hour, uh, plus minus 15 minutes. So it's really expeditious. And no, there's no interference. And yes, it fits in the OR with a Convim. So we need to put that uh, um, to rest. So what are we doing with John? Well, we're recurring actively. Um, we are, um, have a prospective trial called Target, which is sponsored by uh, Oris, in which we're going to have uh, uh, four digits patients, 40 uh, uh, patients per uh, center, roughly 30 centers. So we're going at 1,000 plus um, uh, cases and really look at how can this do prospectively now that we know what we're doing and we're fast with the controller. Very uh, um it's a, it, it's a very fair, uh, long time do trial prospectively. So I would expect in a year or two to have those results. And also I'm working collegially with Philips in order to uh, take a subset of patients and just do prospective 30, 40, 50 patients with Combeam CT and talk about diagnostic yield, um, center of the lesion and come up with some new definitions, uh, exciting definitions in order to use those as stepping stone for ablation. And um, next uh, slide, please. John, do you want to share a little bit about this? Yeah, essentially what we, uh, what Gus um, and, uh, and I did in collaboration with our team and with um, Oris is come up with sort of a, a uh, user's guide um, tip sheet in order to um, discuss sort of the common um, pitfalls you may run up, you may run in uh, with um, using a, a robot and a comb beam where to position the um, robot, um, when to bring the comb beam in, how to um, set things up. And we made this uh, so that it can be applicable across uh, multiple systems, um, not just uh, one particular uh, brand, but Philips, uh, Siemens, uh, Brain Lab Aero, Samsung, uh, et cetera. Um, again, our, uh, our goal here is not to, not to say that comb beam is necessary uh, in order to get um, uh, good uh, diagnostic results from uh, biopsying lung nodules. This is more um, our vision of where we're going in the future of marrying diagnosis with uh, therapeutics. And so if that's something that, uh, you know, um, an individual uh, is interested in and, and they're and interested in getting their system to support, uh, this tip sheet can help um, get you through some of the, uh, the growing pains that we had to experience when we first um, started doing this initially on, on, uh, on uh, plastic dummies and then um, uh, later with, uh, with patients. Next slide, please. And probably last slide, correct? And this is something that uh, John and I, and this is our last slide, we firmly believe. When, um, when a couple of years ago I was faced with the decision of, am I going to really invest in a company that was funded and 
there was no parent company and uh, am I really going to move forward with something that there's no literature and am I really going to move forward and uh, with the uncertainty uh, but once you have the hand on the controller once you can see what it's able to do you know that everything you've done it can be improved and I believe that we as interventional pulmonologists and as van bronchoscopists we we have to be uncomfortable we have to push ourselves to do things that you know I want to write the story I don't want to read the newspaper I don't want to have to have abundance of literature in order for me to come to my C-suite administrators and say, I think that there's seven hospitals that have really good stuff. I want to be the one with John and other leading centers to come up with a way to provide very much so we need patients with alternatives. Stop it with the repeat cases, stop it with the non-diagnostics and atypical cells, no more of uh, we cannot do any more SVRT and, 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 and you know, go into palliation chemo. We need to lead the charge and we need to trust that uh, Monarch through Oris is, in my eyes, uh, the best platform out there. I believe that it's highly compatible with any Convim CG um, systems. I believe that whenever you uh, conduct robotics, you have a fairly good level of confidence that is going to get you very close, but it cannot do the biopsies for you. I think that once we have our hands free and we uh, believe in the uh, software that is embedded in the robotics it, we, we, as platform, once we uh, have uh, these uh, patients that John was alluding to of a one-stop shop, we can theoretically provide them what they need is just come to the hospital, get their cancer cure and go home and then follow. Uh, I think that we should take a look deep down inside of where we think that we're going, what is it our capabilities in each system, find out if maybe there is a convinced city somewhere sitting in your hospitals and, and, and there to do something that is somewhat disruptive. But at the end of the day, you will have very, very appreciated patients that throughout all of this, you open your eyes and you saw the opportunity to take uh, your programs to the next level. I really appreciate the time that um, uh, we were provided. I know that I speak for Chris and John that we're very appreciative about all the uh, uh, work and time that has been put uh, engineering and R&D from the company. We um, would like to continue uh, engaging with the community in order to share our experiences. Um, definitely, we would love to entertain any questions. This is not a perfect approach, but it's one that can be perfected. So um, anybody with ideas, anybody with suggestions, please reach Chris, reach John, reach me. Keep your eyes open. Great things are about to come.